Well, this passage, as it was being read, I wonder if you saw that the theme that comes up and that it's all about is um, Jesus being king. It comes up at least eight times in the passage. So verse 2, the chief priests question Jesus about it. Verse 3, Pilate asks him about it. Verses 9 and 12, Pilate calls him it, the king of the Jews. Verse 18, the soldiers mock Jesus for it. Verse 26, he's charged with it. Verse 32, on the cross, he is derided and mocked for it. And verse 39, finally, the centurion recognizes him as it, as he says, surely this man was the son of God, a synonymous phrase. Jesus, the king. Now, I don't need to tell you that... um, Leadership and kingship, I suppose, or leadership in uh, more specifically, is very much in our consciousness at the moment. We have an election only a few days away. Um, There are impeachment proceedings in America for the leader of the US. And so leadership and, you know, what leadership looks like, what it should look like, is very much in our consciousness. It's something we're grappling with at the moment. And often we're not particularly enamored with our leaders in Western society. And I think one of the reasons that we are so animated by leadership is because it really matters. I mean, think on a, just on a a low level, you know, leadership in a local context, a community leader, um, maybe a a father or a mother in a home or a counsellor can have a profound impact for better or for worse on your lives. That's just at a local level with someone with the limited sphere of human authority. How much more when it comes to national authority, those who govern a nation can significantly bless that nation or be a curse on that nation, depending on how they exercise that authority. So when Jesus is called king, when Jesus is called God's king, wherever you stand on that, we're being asked to imagine and think, Well, if he was to bring all of God's divine goodness, all of God's divine wisdom, all of God's divine power to bear on this world, what could that do? The blessings would be unimaginable, right? But that, of course, depends on what type of king he is and why we might need him as king. And that's what this passage is really all about. It's here to show us once and for all in Jesus' defining hour the type of king he is. And if you're looking into this, this is really the place to go. If you want to know what Jesus is like, look at his death, because his life is all about his death. Similarly, this is also humanity's defining hour, as we're going to see, and this shows us what we are really like. So let's dive in and let's look at it. And first of all, I've given the first part, the heading, Jesus, the innocent king, died for the guilty. Because in this early part of the passage, Jesus is on trial for his life, but as we see him as being innocent, Everyone else is exposed for being guilty. Look down with me, first of all, at verse 1. Chapter 15 on page 1022, if you've shut it. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. This is the entirety, pretty much, of the Jewish religious establishment of the day. It was a theocracy, which meant that the religious rulers really ruled their nation, but of course they're under Roman occupation. And it is not usual that something like this would happen very early in the morning, uh, i.e. under the cover of darkness. We are intended to see that this is subterfuge, this is secrecy, this is them having something to hide. And why would you hide the trial um, for a person for his life or death? Well, clearly because this is a kangaroo court, as we saw in the earlier chapter. Uh, This is them acting unjustly. This is them condemning an innocent man. And actually, later on in the passage, we see how they then activate and stir up the crowd in verse 11. But the chief priest stirred up the crowds to get Pilate to release Barabbas instead. Now, Barabbas is a known murderer. He's been on trial. He's been found guilty. So getting a known murderer release would be bad enough, but getting a known murderer release in exchange for an innocent man, that is atrocious in any world. That would be worthy of an independent inquiry and they would be condemned for it. So the chief priests are guilty. Not only the chief priests though, lest we think it's just them, look at how Mark also includes the crowd in verses 13 and 14. So the chief priests stir up the crowd And Pilate says, what shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate, pointing out to the crowd his innocence. Crucify him, they shout all the louder. So the crowd may be stirred up by the chief priest, but they're still responsible for their reaction. They get the chance to change their view, change their plea. No, crucify him, release the murderer. The crowd are guilty as well. 
And then Pilate, you may be thinking, well, he's trying to deal with an unruly mob. You know, he at least tries to please Jesus' innocence. But look at verse 15, lest you want to let him off the hook. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged, handed him over to be crucified. He should be the executor of justice, but like so many leaders down history, he cares more about the opinion polls than about doing what is right. And he ends up going down in history as the man who issued the verdict to crucify the Lord of glory. So the chief priests, the elders, the Sanhedrin, they're guilty. The crowd, they're guilty. Pilate, he's guilty. Is anyone innocent? Well, only Jesus. Even Pilate himself acknowledges this. Why? He's done nothing wrong. Everyone is guilty. Jesus is innocent. Now, Mark intends this to be a literary device. Whenever you're reading scripture, it's always important to ask, how would you write yourself into these events? Where would you place yourself? I know in my vanity of my own heart where I would place myself. Oh, I like to think that I would be the one solitary voice standing up to the crowd. No, 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 release him, I would cry. I imagine you would probably do the same. Oh, I wouldn't call for him to be crucified. I'm certainly not the chief priest, and I'm not in a position of authority like Pilate. I'm probably in the crowd, and I wouldn't want him to be crucified. Amaryllis Fox is a CIA operative who worked undercover in terrorist cells, infiltrating them. And she was asked to reflect on this remarkable career in an interview that she gave um, a number of years ago. And she said this in the interview of one of the great things that she had learned about seeing these different organizations and terrorists plotting um, their um, attacks on the Western world often. She said this, everybody thinks they're the good guys. Isn't that true to human nature? Terrorists committing acts of atrocity, don't you think the man at London Bridge thought he was the good guy? He doesn't think he's a monster. No one ever does. And if you were in the crowd that day, you'd think, well, I was just going along with the crowd. We all think we're the good guys. We all like to write ourselves into the story as the hero of the piece, whilst everything in our lives points to the opposite. How many times do we turn a blind eye to injustice? How many times do our friends go along with the flow and we jump in with them, adding our voice to theirs because we lack the courage of our convictions? How many times do we espouse high ideals and then in the walk of our own lives fall short of those ideals and then when we're pressed on it, we say, no, 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 I'm a good person, showing the blindness to our own lack of goodness. We read this account with Mark making it really clear this is humanity's defining hour and he says, were you there, you would have done the same thing. And we say, no, 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 not me. I'm one of the good guys, which merely shows to expose our ability for self-deception. Unless you think that this is too harsh, read on. As we see, secondly, Jesus, the derided king, died to save others. Because in verses 16 to 32, detail the derision and mockery that Jesus endures. Verse 16, the soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. A company of soldiers, the word there in the original Greek, means something the size of a battalion. We're talking several hundred soldiers. And they think they're going to have a bit of sport with this weak Jew. So they, verse 17, they put a purple robe on him. Then they twist together a crown of thorns, Middle Eastern thorns, about one and a half to two inches long, and they push it into his brow, and they began to call out and mock him, Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. And so you think, well, this is just soldiers. They're brutal. It was a brutal time, but not just the soldiers. Read on, verse 29, as Jesus crucified, those who passed by, just the passers-by, hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourselves. The chief priests again in verse 31, they also mock Jesus. He saved others, they say, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And even those crucified with him heaped insults on him. You see Mark's analysis is anyone exempt? The soldiers, the crowd, the chief priests, the criminals, Pilate, everyone's in on it. And you think, if I'd been there, it would have been different? Robert McKee, who wrote 
books called Story, which is regarded by many as the authoritative work on screenwriting and was deeply influential in the screenplay for Lord of the Rings, and Peter Jackson um, read it and was heavily influenced by it, wrote this in the book. He says, human character is revealed in the choices we make under pressure. The greater the pressure, the deeper the revelation, the truer the choice to the character's essential nature. Do you hear that? The greater the pressure, the truer the revelation of human character. Now, that is not the way you and I think, is it? Because we think that when we're under pressure, we're caught off guard. We have that phrase, I was caught off guard, bad week, children shouting, going nuts, pressure at work, really tired, having a difficult day, caught off guard. It's not me. I'm not like that when I lost it. No, no, no. That's the point. That is you. That's the real you. Exposed, caught off guard for a moment. That's you. And this is the greatest pressure humanity has been ever under. Because finally, humanity comes face to face with the Lord of glory. In all his innocence, in all his magnificence. But here's the point. He is vulnerable. He's weak. He hasn't come in power. He's come in humility. So what do we do? Do we say, oh, amazing ideals, I want to live that way? How attractive. Do we say, yes, you're the king that I need because I obviously can't govern my life because I make such a mess of it? No, we say this, you're a threat. I will not have you in my life. No, 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 until with every protestation we are hammering in the nails. Mark wants us to see this is the truest revelation of human nature. Were we there, we would have done the same thing. Now, that doesn't mean that you're a monster. It doesn't mean you're as evil as you could be, but it does mean this. In your heart, as there is in my heart, is a seed. And if that seed is given enough opportunity, it will grow up to do the most profound evil. Every human being is a profound mix of high ideals and fallen realities. And we don't want Jesus in our lives. That is what the Bible calls sin. We push him away. But even as the darkness closes in, even as we see that the prevailing belief in Western liberalism that we are basically good is deeply undermined by this text and indeed by history and the news that we watch every day, there is a ray of light that comes into this text. Because did you notice the deep irony of the mockery? Verse 30. Come down from the cross and save yourself. How ironic when it is precisely because Jesus won't come down from the cross that he can save us. He saved others, verse 31, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe when it is precisely because he stayed on the cross that billions of people across history have believed in him. Even in their mockery, God is sovereign and God is accomplishing something marvelous. Let's look now in detail at what that is. Third point, Jesus, the abandoned king, died to welcome us in. I want us to note very carefully here three things that Mark draws us attention to. The darkness, the cry, and the curtain. Let's look first of all at the darkness. Verse 33, at noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So it starts at noon, and darkness comes over the land for three hours. Let's be clear, this is not just a cloud passing in front of the sun. This is attested to by secular historians as well. This was three hours of supernatural darkness that to this day have no naturalistic explanation. This cannot be an eclipse. It was not the season for it, and an eclipse lasts a minute at maximum. This was three hours. Now, you know the effect of darkness. Of course, as we become adults, I've got little children, and Oliver runs in, Daddy, Daddy, I'm afraid of the dark. And I say, don't worry, son. And I go and tuck him into bed, and I think, I'm an adult. I can cope with darkness. But if you walked down a street in London when one of the lights is out, and if you're in a foreign neighborhood and the light is out, even as an adult, you just feel that little chill, don't you? So what would it have been like on that day when darkness descends on the land? And first of all, you think, well, the light's going to come. And then the minute turns into 10 minutes, and 10 minutes turns into half an hour, and half an hour rolls on. The chill doesn't go. There's no way to switch the lights on. Suddenly, you're plunged into darkness. And there's a theological point to it, because in the Bible, 
God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Talks of God's moral purity, his absolute goodness, his life-giving, loving joy. So when darkness comes in the Bible, it's symbolic of God withdrawing the goodness of his presence, withdrawing his love. And when I first read this as a teenager, I suppose, when I took it a little bit seriously, started to engage it, I completely missed the point. I read this and I thought, of course God is withdrawing his presence. Of course God's upset. They're crucifying his son. What father wouldn't be upset? He's angry at the people crucifying him. And that's why the darkness comes over the land. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Except, who cries out? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verse 34. The crowd don't cry out because they're forsaken. The chief priests don't cry out because they're forsaken. Pilate doesn't cry out. The soldiers don't cry out. The criminals on the cross don't cry out. All of those people, including you and me, we deserve to be forsaken, but only one person is forsaken. Who is it? It's Jesus. The darkness of God withdrawing his presence, the darkness of God's just anger at all of the moral failings in your life and mine falls on him. He is forsaken, though he's innocent. Try to grasp something of this significance of this. We'll be plumbing this for eternity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit had been in an infinite and perfect relationship of love throughout all eternity. There was never a moment when the delight of the Father was not in the Son and the delight of the Son not in the Spirit and the Father, loving each other, infinite delight, infinite joy, unbroken. And then at this moment on the cross, the bond is gone. The father doesn't just turn his back on the son, but he actively pours out all of his just and right anger at all human sin throughout all of history. And the bond is severed. Can you imagine the agony? A few years ago, two very close friends of mine who'd been together and bought a house together, we all thought they were going to get married. They'd been living together for the best part of 10 years. And out of the blue, she left him. I won't go into the whys and wherefores. But I went to see my friend um, afterwards, and I was trying to comfort him. And a couple of days later, he was just in pieces. His life was falling apart. And as we chatted, he said to me, Pete, the worst thing is that when I'm sad, she's always the one I went to. When I needed comfort, she was always the one who knew what to say to me. But now I can't go to her. I can't call her. And then he said, it's the sudden loss of intimacy that is killing me. What do you think it was on the cross that killed Jesus? I tell you, it was not the nails through his hands or his feet. It was not the beating he took at the hands of the soldiers. It was not asphyxiation. It wasn't even the spear in his side. It was the sudden break, the sudden loss of intimacy with his father that killed him. The father poured out on him all of his just anger and indignation at sin. That is what killed the son of God. And he did it. For you, for me. You see that in the curtain. This is just such a glorious detail. Initially, it's a bit of a head scratcher, but verse 38, as Jesus cries out, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The curtain which symbolized God's separation from humanity, the, God, the, ten, the curtain which symbolized God's perfection and the way that he could not dwell with that which is unholy or imperfect. The curtain which was a big keep out sign, so that even though we want to draw near to God, the curtain said you cannot draw near to God. So that one person, once a year, the great high priest, only with much rigmarole and much ceremonial cleansing and much offering of sacrifices, could go in for one moment and then had to come out again before it was too late. That curtain that stood at the heart of the temple, that was feet thick, was torn in two. And it was done from top to bottom. It was a work of God. It wasn't done by humanity. It wasn't us bridging the gap. He did it. Why did he do it? Because suddenly the keep out sign is torn down. Suddenly all the barriers to God are torn down. Suddenly the doors fling open and God says, come in, come in. 
Because Jesus has died, you can have life. Because your guilt has been paid for, you can be counted innocent, though I know you're not. Because he's been shut out, you can be welcomed in. Because he's been rejected, you can now be accepted. This is the cross. This shows you the type of leader he is, that he would die for you. And it tells you what you are really like, that you need him to die for you. You know, all of us have high ideals and fallen realities. It's what philosophers call the gap between the real and the ideal. We know the way to live. We're often articulate in talking about it, particularly when we moan about others. I know, I'm sure, not you, just me, right? But we talk about it. We make bold promises and then we break our vows. We describe the way that humanity should live to make the world better and then we go and trample all over that every week, week by week. And then when we talk with one another, we pretend like we haven't done that. And then when we greet each other at church, Christians do this, we say, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. I'm glad we both agreed on that. We're all fine. So why are we here? The gap between the real and the ideal is so great In our consciences, we're aware of the guilt. Often in our public persona, we're aware of the shame. And we're so good, many of us, and articulate at pretending it's not there. Except sometimes when our head hits the pillow in the small hours of the night, and that thing we did or that thing we thought or those words we spoke in error suddenly come out, and we think, what am I doing? Why am I a perplexity to myself? Who will accept me when I can't even accept myself? And so we go through the normal routine, don't we, to deal with it? We justify it. It was an off day. We try to explain it away. I'm not really like that. We psychologize it. Oh, it's just a thing, probably a product of my upbringing. We try to self-atone for it. If I make it in the world, then I'll feel better about myself. But still the gap remains. Still the guilt remains. Still the shame remains. But it doesn't need to because Jesus has died for it. If you grasp that he's died for you, it's gone. The gap between the real and the ideal has been bridged, not by you. The curtain in the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. God has come down. He's entered in. He's done something about it. This is the cross. It is glorious. When you get it, oh, the relief. Oh, it's like a cool stream on a summer's day. A soothing balm to the soul. Do you know it? Not just do you know about it, but friends, do you really Know it. Is it a functional reality in your life? Does it change you? Does it silence the voices of self-justification? Does it slow down the quickness to defend? Is it starting to bridge that gap in your soul and make you whole? Well, lastly, as we think about how we apply this, Jesus, the risen king, died for those who follow him in verses 40 and following. It's interesting in Mark's gospel, unlike many of the other gospels, there are very little details given to the resurrection we're going to see. And you might be thinking, what's going on with the odd and abrupt ending of Mark's gospel and then the whole bit in italics from verse 9 to 20? What are we going to do about that? Well, let me just say a few words because I do think something needs to be said about this as I pull into a lay-by. Firstly, Um, I do think, authentically, and with the early manuscripts, as you'll see by the bit in brackets underneath verse 8, do attest that Mark's gospel really does end this abruptly, and that was intentional. Um, We'll come to that in a moment. It's likely that the early church was so surprised by the early and abrupt ending of Mark's gospel that they thought a bit of it had been lost in oral tradition and passing on, and so therefore they tried to write verses 9 to 20 as a way to give it a proper ending. Ah, you might say, there we go, I knew the Bible was changed, it's not very reliable, this just proves it. Far from it. First of all, the accuracy of the Bible, as you compare manuscripts, is beyond anything else in the ancient world. So if you reject the Bible, you can't accept any antiquity history as authoritative because the Bible blows them all out of the water. Secondly, this is one of the few places in Scripture where we do have uh, a change. And notice how it's clearly flagged up. In other words, there's no subterfuge, this is not a secret, it's an open secret. This has happened, we're not sure about it, we'll flag it up, we'll make it really clear. Christianity is committed to the truth. This should give you confidence that what you read in Scripture really is Scripture and really goes back to the original eyewitness accounts. Any changes are always flagged up. So why the ending, you say, of verse 8? I'm glad you asked. Well, remember the film M. Night Shyamalan, The Sixth Sense? I'm about to give a big spoiler away, so sorry, shut your ears if you don't know how it ends. But at the end of that film, Bruce Willis, punchline, he's a ghost. (gasps) 
And immediately that you watch the film, you want to go and watch the whole film again to try and figure it out. Or in the cinema after I watched it, everyone was talking about it as they left the cinema because the shocking ending got us all talking. It provoked a reaction. I think that's what Mark is trying to do here. I mean, what kind of ending is verse 8? Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. End credits. What? What's going on? Q Cinema, everyone talking, right? So talk about this afterwards. What do you make of it? Why is it here? Let me suggest some reasons why it's here. I think primarily it's here to ask us. The women are trembling and bewildered on the back of seeing Jesus die and hearing the testimony from the angels of his resurrection. This is how they respond. How are you going to respond? I think it's there to provoke us to how are we going to respond. And in the earlier verses of this section, we get a model response in the life of Joseph of Arimathea. Look down with me at verse 43 of chapter 15. I think Joseph of Arimathea is intended to be a model response for us. Verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. The disciples have fled. The women are standing at a distance, but one person goes boldly happy to associate himself with the crucified Messiah. And not only does he go boldly, but also by taking down the body and laying it in a tomb. A tomb was a very expensive thing. It was a very costly response. The spices for burial and the linen cloth in verse 46 would have been very costly. So it's a costly response. It's bold, it's costly. And notice how personal it is. When you lay someone in your family tomb, you are saying, this man is part of my family. He becomes part of my heritage, my line. I identify with him. See the contrast here earlier? The day before, the night before, Peter had denied Jesus. Now Joseph of Arimathea says, he's one of mine. I'm one of his. He lies in my tomb. And of course, as he goes to Pilate, he doesn't know how Pilate will respond. Pilate could have said, you're one of them too. I'll lock you up. He doesn't know. It's costly, it's bold, and it's deeply personal. And we're intended to think, how will you respond? Will you be similarly bold? Will your response be similarly costly, whatever the cost might be? And will it be similarly personal? As I close, let me give three Bs of application. An application for the bewildered, an application for those who've blown it, and then an application for those of us who are called to be bold, which is all of us, by the way. First of all, an application for the bewildered. Notice in verse 8 of chapter 16 that the women are bewildered, and yet they turned out to be the earliest witnesses to the resurrection. What that shows us is if you're here and you're asking questions about Christianity and your head's scratching and you're saying, I don't know what to make of this, I'm hearing this for the first time, you're in good company because the earliest witnesses were exactly the same way. Because this is remarkable. Someone dying for your sins, someone rising from the dead, what do I make of that? If you're asking that question, God loves an honest questioner. Keep pushing into the questions because here's the thing. If the women hadn't pushed in and hadn't seen what they'd seen, they wouldn't have become out the other side being believers. And they must have been believers because how on earth otherwise was the testimony transmitted going forward? So verse 8 implies that they went move from bewilderment to being believers because they carried the earliest message. You might be starting with bewilderment at the moment. If it's true, it will stand up to scrutiny. Ask your questions. Be an authentic inquirer, and the Lord will lead you to belief. For those who've blown it, do you see in verse 7 what the angel says? Go tell his disciples and Peter. Only a few hours before, Peter has denied his Lord, and the cock has crowed. He's gutted. I don't know, you probably arrive at church this week, and your week's been fine, but for some of you, you'll have had an absolute mess. And you'll be sitting here thinking, I hope no one asks me because I don't want to lie. And you're thinking, actually, this is not a place for me because everyone here looks so perfect. Let me let you in on the secret as a pastor knows. We all blow it. Christianity is for people who blow it. Peter, the great apostle, blew it worse than any of us. He denied the Lord of glory. And the message of grace is he's going ahead of you into Galilee. Go tell his disciples and Peter. In other words, speak grace to him. Restore him. I've still got purposes for him. Because Jesus died on the cross not for those who get it right, but for those who blow it. He died to forgive you. Whatever you've done, you say, you don't know what I've done. I don't need to know. The Lord does, and he still died for you. 
When you doubt that, when the devil comes on your shoulder and says, he can't forgive you this time, not this time, look at verse 7. Go tell his disciples and Peter, insert your own name in there. He died for you. He loved you. He restores you. There is no sin that is so great that God's grace cannot redeem it. Bewildered, blown it, well, God wants us to be bold like Joseph. This week and over the Christmas period, we've got a great opportunity to be bold, be bold in inviting with your community, with your neighbors, with your colleagues. Maybe nobody knows you're a Christian. Maybe you've been too embarrassed to talk about it. Well, now is the time. Because Jesus died for you, because he's risen, take up your cross, stand up and say, yes, I'm one of his followers, and invite people along. They might just say for a bit, I never knew. Fine, they'll get over it. And invite liberally. Don't negotiate for people. The person who's most vehement against you might be the next person that the Lord is going to lead to come to know and worship him. Because the centurion in verse 39, who is as unlikely as anyone, the one who executed him, stands there and says, surely this person, this man, was the son of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ, his death in our place, the innocent dying for the guilty, the one who was derided dying for those who mocked him, the one who was rejected dying so that we might be welcomed in, and the risen king dying for those who follow him. Help us to follow him with boldness, whatever the cost to our reputation, to our wallets, to our lifestyles, Help us to trust him, because if he's a king who's laid down his life for us, is there anything he won't do for us? Challenge us, Lord. Help us to discuss this afterwards and work it through what it looks like in our lives, and particularly if we're feeling like we've blown it and there's no place for us in Jesus' kingdom. Reassure us of your grace at the cross, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen.